Uh, thanks, Brian. Uh, my name is Yannick Metzner. I'm the head of North America at Pionix, and I do sales and business development for the U.S. And I have with me my colleague Kai Uwe Hermann, who's joining us remotely from Germany, where Pionix is headquartered. Um, so this session is titled uh, How to do DC Charging with Everest, and we've heard a lot already today about a little bit about Everest here and there, but we haven't really spoken about uh, what is Everest, so I want to talk about that a little bit before I hand over to Kai. Um, so next slide, please, Kai. So the charging ecosystem has been around for 10 plus-ish years. Um, and as we all know, if you're driving an EV, it's a little bit of a mess. I've been in this industry for seven years and it's slowly getting better, but there's still a lot of issues with interoperability um, or just like the folks from ThoughtWorks were talking about, people are not using best practices in implementing uh, software in this industry. So, you know, we've had issues where chargers run Windows and some unauthorized person could use a team viewer to remotely access the charger. Um, and there's, you know, other charging stations that just use a, are based on a Raspberry Pi and you open them up and you can, you can hack them pretty easily. So um, there's a lot of stuff where open source can help make things more reliable and more secure. Um, next slide, please. So a lot of these issues come about because people, they either re-implement the same commodity protocols that we've been talking about all morning, like OCPP and ISO 5011-8, or they buy solutions from an external company that's kind of a black box to them and they cobble it together with other internal solutions or other black boxes. And it's just kind of a, a messy system. Um, next slide, please. So that creates um, a lot of compatibility issues between the car and the charger and the cloud um, and reliability issues and all that. So um, Pionics was started three years ago with the mission to solve EV charging through open source. Um, one more forward, please. And we're trying to do that with Everest. So Everest is a open source um, common base layer that runs on the charging station as an embedded operating system and uh, offers a standardized implementation of these standards uh, that we talked about like OCBP and 1511.8. Um, so that the industry can kind of leverage this and then just build individualized value add components on top, whether that's load management or UI or other more advanced functions so that you all don't have to focus on re-implementing the same commodity stuff, but you can really focus on innovating. So Pionix uh, initiated Everest um, and then kind of handed over governance of the project to our partners at the Linux Foundation. We are still very involved. We're a major code contrib contributor. We are involved in all the working groups, um, but we also offer a commercial product based off of Everest, which is called Basecamp, and I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of this talk. Um, but uh, next slide, please, Kai. Everest in general um, is uh, gaining a lot of momentum. We're super happy about uh, how many people are collaborating and contributing to it. So uh, these are some stats from the last 12 months. We have over 240 total uh, individual contributors now on GitHub to the Everest project. Uh, it's been up 320% just in the last 12 months. And we have a pretty good geographic distribution as well. So obviously Pionics is based in Germany, um, ChargeBite contributed a lot, they're also based in Germany, but we now have a lot of contributions also from North America and even from Asia. Um, there are some folks from uh, a university that are also working on uh, donating a Chardemo implementation. So, so far we've been mostly focused on CCS, but soon hopefully we'll also have Chatamo with an Everest. So it really becomes a global open source layer that can, you can use in all regions uh, to charge vehicles. Um, and, and we also have about 40 organizations that these 240 contributors are associated with. So there's some, some big corporations which are allowing their developers to spend you know, part of their time contributing to Everest, which is really great. Um, so that's enough from me about Everest, and uh, I'll hand it over to Kai, who's going to go into more detail about how you can actually use Everest to run a charging station. So, thanks. All right. Hello, everyone. I hope uh, you can hear me well. And um, I'm just going to uh, yeah, quickly introduce myself. I'm, I'm Kai. I've been working at Pionics uh, 
for over three years now on on the Everest project. So I've been involved for uh, pretty much since, yeah, right after the inception. And I'll uh, give you a quick um, introduction today on, in general, how um, DC charging uh, works and uh, then um, give you a bit of an overview on how you can do uh, a DC charger um, using uh, Everest and uh, some uh, hardware that is uh, either already available as, as open hardware at the moment or, or will be uh, available uh, in, in the short term. So uh, let's jump uh, right in and um, yeah, uh, let's talk about uh, how, how DC charging works. Uh, here we are uh, fortunately quite, quite lucky um, in uh, North America and uh, and Europe, uh, the systems uh, are very similar. Um, they are basically electrically, at least for DC, uh, identical. Uh, even though uh, the the plugs are, are very different. In, in Europe, we use the CCS uh, combo type uh, two uh, plug. You can you can see on the right. And in North America, you uh, traditionally use the uh, combo uh, type one uh, on plug, uh, where you can see that the the pin uh, layout is, uh, is pretty much identical. It's just uh, two uh, AC phases uh, more in, in in Europe, and um, the uh, upcoming NACS uh, standard that basically uh, I guess will uh, become the dominant uh, plug standard in in the United States from now on uh, is electrically uh, at least for DC. Uh, completely identical and uh, the signaling is, is also the same. So um, all what I'm uh, going to tell you uh, from now on is, is uh, applicable to uh, to North America and, uh, and Europe alike. So uh, as you probably know, um, charging in general uh, from an electric vehicle um, uses uh, a PWM con uh, control pilot uh, signal to basically communicate some very uh, basic states between the, the vehicle and the, the charging uh, station. This is a one kilohertz uh, PWM uh, signal that oscillates between uh, plus 12 and, and minus 12 volts and can be uh, this voltage can be lowered by some resistors as well. Um, to encode different states. And on top of this uh, signal, uh, a uh, power line communication signal is, is moduled on, on top of it uh, using the uh, home plug uh, GreenFi uh, standards. So we're using basically one, one wire uh, for two different uh, protocols that uh, build on top of each other. Um, and then there's a, a different signal that's called the, the proximity pilot. Works slightly different in, in Europe to, to North America, but uh, uh, here we're kind of lucky. It uh, doesn't really get used in uh, DC charging anyway, so we can just uh, ignore that uh, for the purpose of this presentation and uh, focus how um, a uh, CCS DC charging uh, session works. And uh, this will will go a bit into the detail how this how this works. Uh, we'll go through all of these uh, 16 steps from the plugging in of a car uh, through the whole uh, ISO protocol uh, stack uh, usage uh, mm -hmm. until charging and ultimately until the uh, car is uh, plugged out again. So let's uh, start at the beginning. A uh, electric vehicle user. Um, arrives at the charging station and, and plugs uh, in in their car. Uh, what happens next? Uh, the uh, the charger, the EVSE, uh, then uh, enables a 5% PWM signal on this uh, control pilot. And this uh, signals to the electric vehicle uh, that high level charging uh, is required on this charger and that the power line communication modem is also ready to communicate uh, with the vehicle. Um, what you kind of have to uh, have to know, power line communication, uh, some people may may notice from from the past when they wanted to do some uh, yeah, 
networking in their homes uh, without uh, drilling through walls and uh, laying some uh, some Ethernet cables. Where you can basically buy a few adapters, plug them into your uh, AC uh, system at home, and and have network connectivity over this. This is uh, basically exactly the same. So, um, and this whole protocol uh, needs to solve some uh, challenges because. Uh, technology is being used that is typically used for a shared medium, uh, but we actually want a point-to-point -point communication from the vehicle towards uh, the charging station. So how is this uh, uh, accomplished? Um, the uh, electric vehicle uh, initiates a so-called Slack session. Uh, here it basically says, okay, I uh, am basically this is an electric vehicle and I want to know who who is there who who will answer and um, what can then happen is that uh, all EVSEs that are in range of the signal uh, they will reply to this electric vehicle and uh, this it can happen that in a charging park multiple EVSEs actually answer this uh, answer this call uh, this can even because it's uh, relatively high frequency signal uh, can even happen uh, over the air sometimes um, accidentally. So uh, the EVC basically uh, responds um, to the uh, call that was initiated from the EV. And to find out uh, which charging station the car is physically plugged in, uh, it will send um, 10 uh, soundings and each EVC then uh, responds with uh, a signal to noise ratio, basically, towards the electric vehicle. And um, after these 10 soundings have, have ever happened and been um, answered from the charging stations, the EV then <clears throat> will select the EVC uh, with the best uh, signal to noise ratio and um, basically tell it, okay, I want to communicate with this. However, uh, the charging station could act, could actually just lie and uh, send a better signal to noise ratio than is actually uh, actually there, and uh, so it could always basically uh, catch that uh, session with the car. But in a normal case, uh, charging station is is nice and uh, basically uh, tells uh, more or less the truth, and then um, yeah, the EV will then. Like I said, select this uh, this charging station, uh, sends a match request, and the EVC will then reply with a uh, match response on that uh, and a network membership key. Uh, remember, this is basically uh, what you did in in your home to connect some uh, network uh, adapters over over AC uh, wiring. And there you typically also just press the button and uh, had to maybe select some settings somewhere so everything is in the same network key. This is basically the same. And after this uh, network membership key has been um, transmitted, uh, uh, the EV will then join this newly created logical network with the, with the EVC. Um, security aware people will now uh, probably scream a little bit. Uh, because there's not really a fundamentally great security uh, implemented here because um, you can theoretically just, or, or practically even, uh, log all of these messages um, and kind of uh, collect all of this uh, information and could join this uh, network with the EV uh, and the EVSE as well. But um, yeah, this is unfortunately the way this protocol is designed. Um, the, the next step then, now we're in this uh, logical network, is uh, that we want to have a IPv6 uh, connection between the vehicle and uh, the charging station. This is uh, then accomplished by the EV sending a UDP broadcast message, basically asking, uh, who else is there in this uh, logical network that we just cre created? And um, is TLS available or is it not? Uh, the EVSE will then um, reply. I mean, since it's the only uh, other device in the network, uh, it will reply 
with its uh, IP address and the port number and will say, yeah, I can do TLS or no, I cannot do TLS. Um, now the EV can um, connect to the EVSE using uh, T TCP uh, connection, uh, optionally with, with TLS, um, if it was uh, basically offered to the, to the vehicle. And uh, the whole goal of um, this step, the protocol selection step, is um, to yeah select a protocol that will then be used in the upcoming uh, transaction between a vehicle and charging station. Um, the vehicle uh, will send a list of supported uh, protocols to the to the charger, and the charger will then uh, select a protocol out of this uh, list. And uh, you can see here on the slides the the protocols that are in used uh, in use typically are uh, the DIN 71121 uh, or uh, ISO 1511 um, And yeah, then uh, the EVSE will tell the car, okay, I can do, for example, ISO 1511 uh, dash two, and then the subsequent uh, exchanges will happen over this, uh, over this protocol. Uh, the next step uh, is the session setup. Uh, here is, uh, the goal that we have is that we want to charge, charge uh, start a charging session, of course. Uh, this uh, session setup is then uh, also uh, driven again from, from the EV, like basically all uh, communication is uh, driven by the EV. It's, uh, it sends its ID, which is uh, just the MAC address of the, of the EV, and the EV's E will uh, reply back with uh, its MAC address and, uh, and the session ID. And then, uh, we go into the next step, the uh, service discovery. Uh, and uh, this is performed so that the EV actually knows what uh, the charger can uh, can offer um, the, the vehicle. So the EV requests a list of services and the EVSE then sends a list of all the supported services uh, back to the vehicle. Uh, typical offer here is something like, uh, for example, like, plug and charge, if you can do plug and charge or um, EV charging uh, with DC extended. And uh, interestingly, uh, we're in step seven of this whole uh, protocol. And this is the first time the vehicle actually knows that it's connected to a DC charging station. Uh, before that, uh, it could uh, as well be connected to an AC charging, uh, charging station. Um, it, it doesn't really know that until, until this point. Um, but since we are in a talk about uh, DC charging, we will assume that we're um, now doing a, a DC um, charging session. And um, to actually be allowed to do a charging session, um, we have to uh, authorize um, this, this charging session. And um, here the EV can then uh, select uh, a payment service, either some form of external um, authentication or uh, or plug and charge. It will then uh, request this uh, authorization and it will basically wait until this authorization is either granted or denied. Um, so um, here we have some time uh, on the charger uh, charging station side to basically tell the user, okay, uh, please, I don't know, swipe your RFID card, please authenticate the session remotely over OCPP um, via payment terminal, uh, etc. cetera. Um, then uh, next step uh, is very important uh, because a, a DC charging station is basically a glorified remote controlled uh, battery charger uh, that is completely uh, controlled by the, by the vehicle. Uh, so the vehicle needs to find out what the capabilities of that charging station are. Um, to do that, uh, there's some form of matching um, that happens between them. The vehicle sends uh, its capabilities, so the minimum and maximum voltage uh, and current and the amount of energy that is uh, needed. And the uh, charging station responds uh, with its own capabilities. So again, minimum, maximum voltage, current, uh, power, and uh, 
a schedule when uh, energy is available, where you can do some some smart charging things, or you could do some smart charging things if they were actually supported in the field. It's not really something uh, we we've see, seen a lot uh, in in the field at the moment. Um, so um, basically, once this uh, exchange has happened, uh, you're uh, able to know roughly what uh, the other party uh, can do and can expect. And now we move towards the actual uh, charging process. Um, the next step is uh, a so-called cable check. Uh, this is done for electrical safety. So uh, here we want to find out if uh, the cable assembly is in any way uh, damaged or like, if there's some form of uh, isolation uh, that is not uh, up to up to standard. So uh, the EV goes into this uh, cable check phase, um, goes onto state C on the uh, control pilot signal, um, but the battery still stays completely disconnected. However, the charger now um, closes its uh, output uh, contactors and uh, applies um, a voltage either 500 volts or the maximum voltage it can do. Depends a little bit also on, on, on the standard being used, but um, it replies this voltage onto basically the cable until up until the uh, battery or before the battery of the, of the vehicle. And it will then uh, measure the isolation resistance towards protective earth. And uh, if everything is okay after a while and after a few measurements uh it will respond to the uh to the vehicle okay everything looks fine or um everything doesn't look fine and then the charging uh process uh, would stop at this bit but uh we're in a well working uh, environment right now so cable check uh works and we go to the next step uh in our list which is um a pre-charge. This is also uh, important not only for for safety but also for longevity of the uh, used components, uh, because we can have uh, different voltage levels on on our um, on the battery side and on the charging station side at the moment. For example, if we did a cable check uh, with 500 volts and we would have stayed at 500 volts, or we would have even uh, reduced the voltage down to uh, a lower voltage like i don't know 60 volts or something like that uh, and then the battery on the other side is at 800 volts uh, we would have a lot of sparks uh, if we would close the contactors uh, between the vehicle and the charging station and this pre-charge step uh, tries to uh, prevent this by basically ramping up the voltage uh, or lowering the voltage uh, on the charger side um, that it is roughly the same as the, uh, the voltage on the battery side of the vehicle. And um, the vehicle will then, uh, or can then check uh, if it wants, wants to do that. Some vehicles actually don't really care, uh, but uh, they should then measure the voltage difference if it, and if it's deemed uh, low enough uh, to safely be able to, uh, to close the connection. Uh, the contactor on the EV side uh, is also closed. And this is the moment where uh, the charging station is directly connected to, uh, or more or less, directly connected to the, to the battery on the, on the vehicle side. Uh, which brings us into the, uh, the next step, uh, the actual battery charging during this uh, power delivery uh, current demand step. Um, the EV has now uh, closed uh, the contactor. And I mentioned earlier, a uh, DC charging station is just a yeah, remotely controlled uh, uh, battery charger that the EV has more or less full control over or can request full control over, uh, which it will do, uh, do periodically now. And uh, basically, it will uh, request a certain uh, target uh, voltage and current, and the charger will apply uh, these, these uh, requested uh, values. 
and uh, the EV can can always exit uh, this uh, yeah current demand loop uh, whenever it deems it uh, necessary. So if it sees okay the voltage doesn't really uh, fit the voltage I see uh, or um, I basically have enough uh, I, I stop now it it can actually um, do that and um, on exit. Uh, of this loop, power is then shut down, basically uh, voltage uh, ramps down and the contactor on the uh, charging station side actually opens. Uh, because now we perform another step, which is uh, the, the welding detection here, um, the vehicle actually uh, verifies if the contactor on the vehicle side uh, has, has welded and uh, is basically stuck. Um, it tries to open that contactor, and if uh, it opened successfully, it will verify uh, this uh, this opening, and um, uh, yeah, everything is is fine uh, when it goes through that. Um, the next step uh, then is uh, the tearing down of this uh, high level um, control uh, session. Uh, the EV will then uh, stop the session. It can either uh, pause it or it can uh, uh, finish it completely. Um, then what happens next is um, basically uh, the shutdown of that, uh, of that session. So the uh, charging station stops the PWM signal and uh, switches to a plus uh, 12 volt signal on the CP. And um, here uh, the EV and the EVSE can now uh, decide that they may want to restart uh, the, the charging uh, session. Uh, the EV can uh, basically uh, trigger this uh, in a way by going through the state's PCB, PCB toggle, uh, and then a specific sequence uh, will be done, or the EVSE can trigger a restart by uh, enabling uh, the 5% uh, PWM signal again. Uh, however, this is something that uh, not a lot of vehicles do at the moment, I think, because the expectation on DC charging is kind of that uh, it's a one-time affair. You plug into a highway fast charger, you want to um, basically uh, finish as quickly as possible and then be uh, on your way again. But with uh, you know, newer ways of using DC charging, um, like in local uh, solar installations, for example, where, where you um, use a DC to DC uh, microgrid and stuff like that, this could become uh, more desirable. And then we will probably also see uh, vehicles um, picking up uh, this uh, unpausing and uh, resuming from uh, such a session again. And then the final step, uh, we, are, we are on our way. Uh, we unplug uh from the charging station and um uh, then typically the charging station sends uh some form of uh soft transaction message uh via ocpp to some backend uh, system to basically build this uh, session uh won't be going into ocpp at all uh, in this um uh, in this presentation but uh this is how you typically would do the whole uh um transaction uh, management there. All right, and uh, yeah, after, I don't know, 15 minutes of explaining, this is kind of how uh, a DC um, charging session uh, works from uh, beginning to the end. And now I will uh, show you uh, a bit uh, of, uh, yeah, our, uh, our hardware um, that we uh, use or yeah, that we use and, and build um, with Everest to um, yeah have a functioning um, DC uh, DC charging station. So let's have a uh, look at this um, simplified hardware block diagram first. Here on the uh, on the left side, we we basically begin uh, with an AC uh, grid connection, a three phase uh, grid connection. Uh, go through a AC-DC converter that is typically controlled uh, 
by some form of uh, Linux controller where we run uh, Everest on. Um, this is then connected to some form of DC power meter, isolation monitor as well. And on the right side, uh, you have your, uh, your DC uh, uh, contactors. And um, the, the Linux board basically uh, does the, yeah, the main part of the work. Uh, so it does all of the uh, high level um, protocols like, um, yeah, ISO 15.11.8 uh, for the communication with the, with the vehicle, uh, but also, uh, yeah, talks with your human uh, machine interface, uh, some form of display application, uh, RFID readers, payment terminals, uh, et cetera, as well as uh, to the backend systems uh, via OCVP. And this uh, controller is then typically uh, connected to a uh, power line communication modem, as well as some uh, microcontroller that does uh, the PWM generation and, uh, and sampling. Um, to have a functioning uh, control pilot uh, signal. And yeah, this is just a simplified uh, diagram. There will be a bit uh, more in detail diagram in a few slides. And uh, now uh, let's talk about some concrete uh, hardware. Um, this Linux controller board that I just talked about uh, that we at uh, at Pionix uh, basically have released as uh, an open hardware um, design uh, is really just a, yeah, a easy to use uh, dev kit, nothing meant for any form of like production hardware or uh, not optimized for cost, not, not uh, for anything like that. Uh, but it has, uh, uh, it's a very uh, usable, hackable, uh, hackable platform. It just uh, takes a Raspberry uh, Pi compute module on it. It has uh, CAN connectivity, RS485, uh, UART, USB, LAN, whatever you can plug into this, uh, into Raspberry Pi, basically. Uh, we also have a, a display connector. Um, uh, yeah, we, we have a PLC modem on there. We, actually have support for different uh, PLC modems from different uh, manufacturers there. And this is then running the, the, the Everest stack on, uh, on a Linux um, based system. And for the, uh, uh, for the power electronics uh, side, uh, we actually have an, uh, an AC uh, power board, uh, which we call the, the Yeti, which also uh, is uh, released under uh, open hardware license and the firmware for that is also uh, available under Apache license. And um, although this is a, a AC power board, we, we also uh, make use of this board uh, to basically connect uh, the DC contactors and things like that uh, at the moment. So uh, we can basically use the hardware that we had designed a few years ago for uh, for just some AC dev kit uh, to basically build um, a um, yeah DC uh, charging station and uh, how how this can be done uh, can be seen in this uh, block diagram that's a bit more detailed than the one I showed a few minutes ago and uh, it's probably a bit hard uh, to read everything on that, but I think the slides will be available at some point afterwards as well, as well as this is um, going to be um, online on the same uh, basic repository where the uh, open hardware designs are also published at the moment. Um, so you can see a basic uh, way of how you would uh, set up uh, this, this open hardware to be able to build uh, a DC power, um, uh, a DC charging station. So we, we we start basically on the on the left side again with a um, AC free uh, free phase uh, connection, uh, which basically goes uh, through an AC DC converter to power the the YAC board and uh, display and uh, the Yeti board on top, and uh, we then basically uh, go through 
a power meter on the AC side into an AC-DC uh, power supply, go through a uh, DC power meter that is connected uh, to the YAC board uh, and an uh, isolation uh, measurement device uh, to be able to do the, the cable check uh, properly, like I talked about uh, earlier. Uh, then we have the, uh, the DC relays uh, on, on the end uh, and finish with a CCS cable uh, and uh, a plug in the end. Um, how, how does this look like in, in real life? Uh, this is uh, one of, I would say, one of our first uh, prototypes uh, of this uh, for uh, just, uh, I would say, lo relatively low power, 22 um, kilowatt um, DC, uh, DC charger, where we just have this uh, nice, uh, nice uh, 19 inch rack where uh, power supply can be uh, put it into the bottom and all the uh, electronics can be put on top. Uh, since then, we have also built um, bigger versions of this with uh, much higher um, power ratings as well, uh, but using the same basic uh, basic principle. And just to have a, a look under the, the hood on, uh, on how this can be done, uh, just with the disclaimer that this is obviously a lab example uh nobody should uh, run out uh, to the hardware store and uh, try to build something like this and uh, i don't know <laughs> then try and sue us afterwards uh if they uh, hurt themselves this should only be done by actual professionals that know what they're doing um but here you can see uh, basically uh the the ac uh grid input uh cable going through the uh, this uh, circuit uh breaker uh we have the uh, Yeti and Yak boards in the, um, in the lower uh, right, um, all kinds of uh, perfectly well-connected uh, CAN cables and uh, things like that. Um, uh, AC cables going down to the uh, to the power supply that you can see in the in the bottom of this uh, rack, as well as uh, DC cables coming up from the power supply. Um, some very important auxiliary uh, AC outlets if you want to plug in your laptop uh, for, for some debugging. Uh, then the DC cables coming into the uh, DC contactors that are uh, controlled by, uh, by the Yeti board. And all of this then going into the uh, cable to the, um, to the car itself. And um, yeah, once you have uh, built something like this, which is uh, really not, I would say it's not that difficult to do if you uh, if you know what what you're doing and follow the uh, appropriate uh, safety uh, protocols, um, then you can uh, pretty much uh, go on to the next step, which is uh, create a simple uh, Everest uh, config uh, for that. Um, and since this is probably not uh, the most exciting thing to look at. Uh, uh, I kept it relatively short here. So this is just uh, an example on how such a uh, configuration can look like. We, we have a um, graphical tool, um, however, is that can set up these kinds of um, configurations with, um, with different modules. And um, this can be uh, either done on your um, on your development machine, but nowadays we also have a, a version that's uh, uh, hosted on, uh, on on GitHub uh, pages that you can basically click through and uh, and generate your uh, your configurations. And as you can maybe see, this uh, since Everest is a modular system, we can also try and uh, model our modules uh, kind of like the hardware block diagram we we did before. We have uh, an an energy manager and a, a fuse modeled here. Um, to make sure that the electrical safety is also taken into uh, into account, um, the most central module which you can also see in this uh, in this config is the uh, so-called EVSE manager, and this is uh, a module that uh, connects to basically most or everything right, that um, has to do with um, with charging. So uh, we have a Slack module. Uh, to do the Slack process I talked about earlier, an ISO 1511-8 module to do, do the uh, ISO 1511-8 uh, 
parts of the protocol. Uh, there's a, um, we call this board, board support package driver, but basically this is a hardware driver for uh, the control pilot, more or less. Control pilot and uh, the con um, control of some, some, some contactors and things like that. That is connected to the EVC manager. Uh, then we get the input from an uh, isolation uh, monitor. Um, the Kindy eye can see that we also have a simulation uh, a simulated version of that uh, if we just want to go through uh, a quick and dirty setup and we don't really uh, want to do isolation monitoring, we can also uh, quickly simulate some values. Um, since this is driven by the charging station, we can just lie to the car and say everything is fine. Uh, uh, then we have power meter connected and um, the most important uh, piece to actually get uh, power to a vehicle is then a driver for the um, ACDC uh, power supply. And on the top, you can you can see some uh, yeah some some additional stuff. Uh, if you want to do OCPP, uh, you can have that connected and have an RFID reader and, and all kinds of things uh, like that. Um, uh, yeah, um, that's pretty much it. Um, most of this uh, configuration are just off-the-shelf uh, modules that are available uh, in, in Everest. Uh, the most work that is typically needs to be done to get a new piece of hardware running is uh, writing some hardware abstraction uh, layer drivers. So a driver for a um, DC power supply, for example. So if everything stays the same and you just uh, want to use a different power supply, uh, you might have to write a different uh, driver for that, or uh, we might have that available in, in Everest or in, in our uh, commercial offering, uh, which is also the perfect segue to uh, Yannick again uh, to take over for uh, the rest of the presentation. Thanks, Kai. That was awesome. Even I learned a little bit more about the DC charging <laughs> process. I always kind of wondered what Slack actually is and, and what it does, but uh, cool. So yeah, um, this is how you can build a DC charger in a lab or research or university setup with Everest. But if you actually want to go into production and you want a little bit uh, of help, you know, uh, Alex mentioned this morning, there's this virtuous cycle between technology, product, and then donating back into open source. So we see Everest as a technology. The product that we as Pionix offer based on that is Basecamp. Um, and uh, you see that right here. Um, Basecamp is basically a stabilized, tested, certified version of Everest that we provide as a subscription um, on a de device license level. Um, it, it is uh, certified to OCPP. Um, it has some wrapper APIs around Everest that make it much easier to integrate it on any custom hardware. Or if you have any extensions that you're writing, like UI, UX, uh, you have a stable API that you can develop against. And if there's any breaking changes between Everest versions, we at Pionix handle all the changes needed um, so they used to always have a stable interface. Um, we're also working on another product called Summitier Cloud, which is coming out next year. So this is going to be our take on a manufacturer cloud um, that connects to any charger that has Basecamp running. So it's a side channel to the OCPP uh, cloud connection that um, if you're a charger manufacturer, your customer, the operator, or the owner of the station will have an OCPP cloud, for example, something based on Citrino S or Mave, um, and they will use that to implement all their business logic of how they want to manage the charging stations. But um, you as the manufacturer might still want to have connection to your devices in the field for statistical purposes or service and maintenance, and that's what the Materia Cloud is going to help you with. Um, and the good thing is, normally manufacturer clouds only work at one manufacturer, but if multiple manufacturers base their product on base camp, this manufacturer cloud can actually work across manufacturers, which is also useful for certain use cases. Uh, next slide, please. So the team itself, uh, we're about 30 people now based in Germany. Uh, most of us are software developers. And yeah, we're super passionate about making EV charging safe, reliable through the power of open source. Um, the founders had a drone company called Navinci previously, which was um, sold to Intel in 2016. 
And in the drone space, there's a popular open source uh, system called PX4, um, which over time had similar commercial offerings um, that a lot of drone manufacturers adopted. So there's some inspiration there from the drone space that the founders carried over uh, into the EV charging space. Next slide, please. Yeah, and this is our vision. Um, the operating system that will run on every EV charger in the world. So we heard Dr. Shankari this morning talk about the goal of 500,000 charge points in the US by 2030. Uh, our goal is that the majority of those will run Everest, and then the subset of those, uh, the ones that need a little bit of help or, or want you know, someone that gives you support, uh, actually run Basecamp. Next slide, please. So um, if you want to get in touch, uh, for Everest, uh, go to GitHub, um, get on the mailing list, join the Sulip chat, join the working groups, um, get involved, ask us any questions. And then if you want help with um, the more commercial side, pionics.com uh, or contact me today. I have business cards. And um, we also, the hardware that Kai just showed, these dev kits, Yak and Yeti, we sell them. So you can use the open hardware instructions and order all the stuff on like DigiKey or Mauser, but you can also order it at shop.pionics.com if you want it kind of pre-assembled. Next slide, please. And that's it. Um, thanks again, Kai, for joining us late from Germany. Um, any questions for the two of us? Yes. I'm going to repeat the question. Does Everest have a requirement for the car to support 1511.8? Or can it um, charge with also cars that have used the older, more basic protocols like PWM? Um, Kai, do you want to take that? Yeah, sure. Um, no, this is just uh, we, we support um, AC PWM charging. Uh, we, we support uh, ISO 1511.8 2 uh, at the moment, as well as uh, the um, the older, more, I would say, at least in Europe, more uh, widely spread uh, Dean 71 to 1. Um, so there's there's no requirement for, for using ISO 1511.8 uh, in, in Everest. Um, I mean, I, I have a, a Everest-based uh, charger at home, which is just an AC charger uh, that uh, mm -hmm. I have just configured for, for PWM, but I, I could do uh, AC ISO 1511.8, but I unfortunately don't have a vehicle that uh, supports AC uh, ISO 1511.8, which are unfortunately still not very common. Um, but yeah, so that's not really a, a concern. So we support all the relevant, uh, I'd say all the relevant protocols in the, in the CCS, uh, space at the moment. And like Yannick has mentioned earlier, uh, we also have plans for uh, support for Chademo, for example. Um, and um, yeah, others as well. So given this is uh, that this is a community project uh, as well, uh, we are also very happy to uh, engage with uh, anybody who is uh, interested in implementing uh, other parts. So I've seen people talk about uh, basically things like wireless charging or pantograph charging for um, for buses and things like that, um, based on on Everest as well. So, or since we're in the US, uh, IEEE 2030.5. Some people want to use that for AC V to G. Uh, we're still looking for people that want to contribute an open source <laughs> version of that. Uh, yeah, the, and there's this uh, SAE. Uh, the, the the number escapes me, but the SAE standard for basically uh, bidirectional ISO 1511.8-2 uh, uh, charging, uh, which we have implemented, even though we are not sure if there's even a vehicle out there yet uh, that will support that. Uh, yeah, if you know any OEM that want to test that, uh, reach out to me afterwards. <laughs> uh, Brian? I was just going to piggyback off that. Obviously, when you go to the 
Um, so uh, let me repeat the question. Um, it, does Everest recognize that um, if the charger doesn't uh, provide the 5% signal, does Everest then fall back to basic PWM charging? Uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not 100% sure I got, I got the question, but um, there, there's definitely there's different uh, configuration options that can be uh, can be set uh, in just for try, for trying out things uh, with chargers. Most of the fallback mechanisms um, you're really um, dependent on if the vehicle can can fall back. Uh, so basically, some some vehicles it's okay to um, fall, fall back and 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 continue. Um, with basically, let's say you start out with high high level charging, um, uh, AC high level charging over ISO 1511 and, and and realize okay the vehicle actually doesn't support that, uh, then you can fall back to PWM charging, uh, and I think some ve some vehicles don't like that, and you have to replug basically afterwards, um, which is a bit is a bit annoying. Other others have have no problem like uh, my my vehicle we just today did uh, plug and charge uh, testing with, with the vehicle and um, uh, weren't connected to a production uh, backend at the moment. So we went through the whole plug and charge sequence and everything was fine. But in the end, the, the contract was uh, uh, rejected because of the uh, non-production backend. And uh, it then dropped back down to PWM charging and just happily charged. Um, but uh, your, your mileage may vary. It, it sometimes, unfortunately, really depends on, on the vehicles. Uh, if you can do uh, fallbacks uh, while the plug is still plugged in. Uh, but theoretically, it should, should be possible. OK, great. <laughs> yep. job to say OTA is going to be addressed with the Summitier Cloud, which is a paid product from Pionix. Um, I don't know, Kai, do you have any? A Summitier Cloud? No, that's closed source. I think Kai can probably speak, speak to that. Did you get uh, the question? I, I think I got uh, most most of it. Uh, some 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 audio to escape me but um yeah uh the ba basically the the yocto uh that we have we have put out uh into the into the wild uh doesn't include so, any, any form of uh, like over the air update support uh 
basically because there are different um, ways of, 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 of implementing this. Um, like uh, we uh, uh, favor uh, Rauk, for example, in uh, in our I would say commercial offerings, uh, where where we basically like Yannick already already said uh, with this uh, base camp, we we have a, a version of it. Uh, fully AB partitioned, um, doing uh, streaming updates uh, via, via, via uh, Rauk, for example. But we also uh, heard that people are using other things like swap date and, and, and things like that. So um, I would say the, um, the the Yocto that we provide, I mean, this is really new uh, as well. We, we've been providing a meta layer for Everest for, I would say, a bit over over a year or one and a half years now, um, but an actual uh, like image that you can build and, and flash onto, for example, your your Raspberry Pi. Um, we we have that available for, I would say, two two months, two three months now. Um, uh, we we also we also had one available or, or still have one available for for the uh, TI uh, AM six two two X dev kit as well, uh, which is also a Yocto based thing. So um, yeah, there's a follow up question. Yeah, but the images I found that are available there are basically a dev image. It's it's not in any sense where I'd want to put it on any piece of hardware I was going to ever ship. And I don't have any guidance, any best practices of here's the minimum runtime you need to run Everest on, you know, your piece of hardware. I, I don't necessarily need it coded, but it's really unclear as to how to take it from what I can stand up and use as a great test environment down to, okay, here's a the minimum sort of setup that I would run Everest on that is in the ballpark of being secured, right? It doesn't, that doesn't exist. And I've asked the community and nobody's given any advice or, you know, how they've done it or anything like that. And to me, that's a huge miss right now because it's, there's lots of open source projects to get you started. Great. But then the amount of work that you have to do after is larger than what you get as a benefit from the start. And to me, that's a non starter, right? You know, because what did I what did I gain? I have to figure out some of the existing code base, and then also have to do all the the nitty gritty, which is really hard parts of of the product. And I've done lots of shipping IoT and embedded products. That's where I spend you know eighty percent of my time, not on getting the initial stuff up and running. Um, <laughs> there a question in there in the beginning? Well, I'm just asking, are you going to produce anything like best practices? Is any of this stuff coming to share this information? Because right now it's nowhere and nobody seems to be willing to, you know, chip in and say, hey, we've built something. Here's how we generally approached it, right? I mean, you've mentioned something in your commercial products, but if I've got to buy a commercial product to get to that, to get any information on that, I'm buying a commercial product. I'm not buying open. I'm not using open source. Okay, I'm sorry. It's it's a paid for product at that point, and all the other I can. It's like when somebody tells you all this blah blah blah, but well, I just forget everything in front of the but because the truth comes after, right? Uh, you know, you can use everything, but if you want other things, you got to get the commercial support. I mean, the difference between a free and open source project and a commercial product is always going to be effort you have to do yourself. Don't disagree. Don't disagree. But, but usually I'm given some guidance. Like, you know, the project says, hey, we don't have real hardware we run this product on. Here's what you might buy. Here's some suggestions, right? They don't have to handhold me through that, but I at least have a guidance of, oh, it needs list this much RAM, this much CPU, blah, 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 right? And I just don't have that at Everest yet, or at least, again, I'd we, love to. Yeah, I mean, we, we've heard this, this, sorry to jump in. Then again, you need more clarity in terms of how to manual the specs on on what's required in your board or well i got that part i mean you guys got a great reference of limitation but it gets me to a point and then i'm like a miracle happens here and i could make it into a production thing without any sort of we thought we do you know OTAs this way let's ask kai is there 
And did you get the question? I think the question was, uh, is there going to be more guidance uh, within the Everest project on minimum hardware requirements and how to go from a test setup to a more production uh, setup? I, 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 totally, I, I would say I totally agree uh, with uh, what, what you stated in your question, that this is a, a part that uh, is definitely uh, lacking a bit at the moment, uh, especially, I mean, we, we spend a lot of time uh, uh, revamping documentation uh, over over the last year, I would say. And I would say, yeah, you're, you're right. This is something where we should definitely provide some form of, of, of guidance. I mean, we... Uh, I would say within within Pionix, but also so other other partners um, that have have done uh, things with Everest probably uh, have a good feeling for uh, on which hardware it's uh, it's running well, and you can probably piece a lot of this uh, already together with uh, trawling through our mailing list and, and, and Zulip. But uh, since this isn't really like like I don't know a secret sauce or some some uh, I information that uh, is is really hidden. Uh, we we could definitely uh, put a bit more um, of that together in a, in an accessible in an accessible way. So um, yeah, I think this is a, a good a good thing you raised, and and we should uh, improve uh, that a bit. Uh, absolutely right. Uh, not sure how far it will go because uh, obviously it's uh, it's it's also a lot of uh, effort like you said uh, to um, lay lay everything out how, how how to do this and especially like you said the software update really depends on how you want to do this uh, on on your side but I could see an example of okay this is one example of how you could uh, how you could do it um, yeah, I, I, I could see that uh, being created. And I mean, if somebody wants to uh, chime in and maybe discuss something like that in one of our, uh, our working groups uh, as well, like we... We, we have do... a couple more uh, people wanting to chime in. <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, uh, hi yeah. guys, great to see, to, see, to see you in video. Uh, this is Dan Moore uh, from the Accenture Joint Office team. Uh, we're, we're actually working with a number of early adopters right now on including one including our next year. And we're, on, one, we're, we're one talking to you about it as well. Oh, excellent. <laughs> Wait, which, we have a Oh, okay. There you go. Yeah. So we're, we are interested in on, as kind of a ongoing side project in documenting uh, the productionization of Everest. Um, right now our efforts are Yocto oriented, but we are, and I love hearing this kind of feedback in part because we don't know exactly where the gaps are coming from a position of not putting this onto production of itself and trying to support others. So like for example, OTA, we, we don't, we haven't been on our radar, but that's something I'd love to sit down with you and talk to you later that's about. Yeah, yeah. Kind of get some kind of some um, but we're expecting, yeah, in the next, you know, this quarter to be publishing more information on that. Okay, thanks. Sure. Hey, I want to ask, uh, are the yoke of minimal requirements pretty well defined and applying over here? And um, second question, you gave us an example for Raspberry Pi used by yourself. Doesn't that give you kind of the baseline that what can be used for this project? What I've looked at the Octo just recently, I mean, it's literally like two weeks old, or something. It's not very old at all. I just I got it before it came out. I posted something on mailing list, and somebody said, "We're coming out with the Octos thing soon." And I'll send you mail when it came out. And then a couple weeks later, here's the email. And so I did pull it, but it didn't give me. It basically built with the Octo the same thing I could have built by downloading the Raspberry Pi, you know, following the instructions and doing it. And I was like, okay, that's fine, but it doesn't. It, I couldn't minimize it to figure out what's just, the, and I'm still looking for it, um, if I've been traveling and stuff, but I haven't been able to find out what's, okay, here's just a minimal, the smallest part of Everest I need to just run just Everest, right? It still had a lot of the other things with it, and I was like, I don't really want that because it's a hard to secure, like no bread, terribly hard to secure, okay? I don't want that in the, the runtime image. I wouldn't want that. 
great for setting up, great for configuring, great for maintenance, but you know, I'd want the configuration out of that and just shipped into the Everest image, you know, things like that. So no, it, it, it's a start moving in the right direction, it's, but it's the only thing, and it's the only thing there. Uh, but it's fairly, it's really fairly new. I mean, it's very much for example, unless they buy four, you know, you know exactly what you need to do. Yeah, but that's a Raspberry Pi 4, and it's again a full development environment. You don't want to put who ships a full development environment on a production system? Anybody? You know, uh, you don't do that. There's reasons for that, right? You don't want but people. I, but to I guess. To, oh, sorry. You don't want people uh, to be able to compile on the product. <laughs> yeah, go right, ahead. I mean, you're right. I guess this is um, just kind of, uh, I guess, diff different different expectations. Uh, the um, yeah, the 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 Octo image uh, uh, we we created a, a few weeks ago, uh, basically for the Raspberry Pi, which is targeted that the this Yeti Yak hardware combination uh, was was never intended to to be a, a stripped down productized uh, version, but really just uh, like like the Yeti Yak hardware isn't uh, a productized uh, version, uh, uh, would be way too expensive uh, to put in a product. Um, it, it, it's more like a all bells and whistles kind of thing. But uh, if there is demand for that and an in interest, and I just wasn't aware that that this is something, uh, uh, this is certainly something we we, we could also think about. Uh, maybe uh, like a minimal, uh, like a minimal image. This basically just boots up uh, Everest uh, and does PWM charging, but doesn't have like anything uh, installed that you don't need. Uh, but it was more or less, I think, created with the idea in mind that this is basically what we had uh, before when you bought a Bile box, for example, you had uh, images that uh, were um, regularly updated for that, uh, where it also was a very um, full-featured uh, system with all kinds of more developer-centric uh, views, but yeah. Okay. No, I like the Octo thing. Thanks for producing it. I don't have a problem with it. It just was like, I was trying to figure out how to get to, you know, I get read your documentation. I've been over the, the mailing groups or anything. I just can't find the information. And that's why I thought, let me ask. It's a mirror. <laughs> yep. And we can follow up offline. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Pionix was the contributor, it's, you know, they're not the controller of the project anymore, right? We're seeing contributions from, what, 40 organizations, 240 people, Joa is getting involved, Accenture is getting involved, Landis and Gear is getting involved. So as we see these emerging needs, it's not necessarily, you know, hey, Pionix, please add this thing. It's, you know, more and more the community can start to, you know, execute on their needs and wants and from a roadmap perspective, which is really cool and powerful. And, you know, maybe somebody from the community emerges and offers a, a commercial alternative to Basecamp. Like, that That could happen. Um, and so I think it's great that you're raising this. And, you know, let's see how, you know, the project can evolve to, you know, support your needs while also, you know, providing viable business models for, for the commercial entities involved. Uh, like I said, I'm excited about it. That's why I dug in this far. Yep. Yeah. It just, I haven't got any response from the community. Yeah. You know, I've raised the questions and I didn't get it. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. That might be useful. It just was, it's just been crickets. Yeah. And, and that, so I'm like, okay. Yeah. And, and I think to echo, I mean, just to kind of circle this back to the first Zoom and to kick this off this morning, outstanding question is, is is a juice worth the squeeze? Yeah, I mean, that's what he just he just explained this process. Yeah. He talked about it as a bigger community, and I get it. From the experiment and the, the ability to share knowledge and work as a group to develop this up, that's important. And I think that that's really, uh, you know, we're, we're finding group genius. But at the end of the day, you're here for a product. And so you yeah. got to figure out, is, is the juice worth the squeeze? Sure. He talked about it earlier at the very beginning of this what he talked about. So that's just something that we just, as a community, we have to think about it in that in that perspective of, yes, it's important to have group genius. It's important to have all these people, and, and this, this is how we get there. That's the only way we get there. we got to get there together. But at the end of the day, we still have to drive it to a, a finite product 
level that you get to work off of. or the email list, but we do also have the working groups. I actually lead our general and Q&A working group, which is bi-weekly Tuesdays, 7.30 a.m. Pacific, so pretty early for me, but um, next Tuesday that's happening again, so that's also a forum. Cool, great. Any more questions? Awesome. Thank you, Kai. Thank you very much. That was an awesome discussion. Thank you so much.